my particular area where we were going, they they told us there was a big sea wall and that the torpedo boys were going to come in and they were going to blow a hole in it and we could go through the wall. So off we go and we sailed up and uh, got off the ships and into the Higgins boats and we were running around and all of a sudden somebody blows the horn and we took off to the beach and our particular boat we hit up we hit a sandbar we probably were a good hundred yards offshore and I can remember we all turned to the the boatsman and said got it so he did and we we went through the sandbar and we went right up on the beach. I didn't even get the soles of my shoes wet. Hmm. We run off, and sure enough, there's the hole. We, we ran through the hole. There was a big firefight on our left, a big firefight on our right, but my unit, we just took off straight. It made me a little nervous because I didn't know who was on my left and who was on my right. But uh, we, uh, we went through Anzio and uh, took off and the Germans were retreating. Welcome to Heroes Behind Headlines. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Today, we're excited to continue our interviews with World War II heroes. These historic interviews were conducted by Joe Massinio over the past decade as part of the Veterans History Project. Today's subject is the humble and brave Lawrence Sparky Rector, who died this past October at the age of 100. Sparky was a decorated World War II hero who was later inducted to the New York State Wrestling Hall of Fame. During the Second World War, Sparky served as a rifleman in the 157th Infantry Regiment, 45th Division, 2nd Battalion. As they battled their way through Europe, starting in July 1943 with the Allied invasion of Sicily, through Italy and France, into Germany, and all the way to the liberation of Munich on April 30th, 1945. Along the way, he fought in some of the war's toughest battles, including Bloody Ridge, Camasso Airport, the Caves, Anzio, the Vosges, the Siegfried Line, and he helped liberate the German concentration camp at Dachau. In their 667 days overseas, Sparky and his regiment were in battle for almost 470 days. During that time, soldiers in the regiment were awarded four medals of honor, 20 distinguished service crosses, 376 silver stars, 1,054 bronze stars, and 1,694 Purple Hearts. Sparky received one of those Purple Hearts, along with six campaign battle stars and a presidential citation. It's my great honor to name the brave Lawrence Sparky Rector as today's hero behind the headlines. Heroes Behind Headlines with Ralph Pizzullo. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Yes, Lawrence James Sparky Rector. Okay, and where were you born? I was born in Syracuse, New York. My date of birth is 5-29-23. My mother's name was Myra Van Dusen and my father's name was Floyd mm -hmm. Rector. My father worked originally for the Perry Pine Pie Company in Syracuse, New York, and my mother was uh, a, a business student out of Oswego, New York, and, but never used it. She was a housewife. Mm -hmm. Did you have uh, brothers and sisters? I had one brother who unfortunately died at a young age of 16 of pneumonia. His name was Delvin Rector. Delvin Rector, okay. Be, uh, let, let's um, set the stage just before you're getting ready to enter the service. Give, just give us an idea of what was going on in your life, for example, um, when you first heard about Pearl Harbor. Well, we had, uh, we had two homes. Uh, 
one that we used for our family to live in, and then next door to us was another home that uh, we used during the strawberry season to house our strawberry pickers. We had a small farm about two miles from our hamlet, and uh, we always had at least an acre and a half to acre and three quarters of strawberries every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was over in the home at the time because I had a pool table and a ping pong table in there, and I had a nice little old Franklin stove that I burned wood in, and uh, I had the radio on, and I heard the news that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. I was uh, probably 18 at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I was uh, astonished, number one, to hear the news, and it excited, and I can remember just going out the door and running across to the my home, and my mom was home, my dad was working, and telling them that uh, I'd heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and we were probably at war. They were excited, too, and not thrilled, of course, to think of war. I was uh, originally thought I would wanted to go into the Air Force, and I uh, went down to the recruiting office and took the exams and did all of the uh, paperwork and so forth, but I had a, a great deal of trouble uh, lining up. My depth perception was very poor, so I flunked out, and uh, so I gave up on that idea, and I just went back, back home and, and waited. I thought I would be drafted, and mm -hmm. I wasn't going to fight it one way or another, and I had no objection to which branch of service I was going to go into because I didn't know any better. I entered the service in February of uh, 40. 43. After I completed basic training, I was uh, sent to the uh, Company G of the 157th Infantry Division, okay. 45th Division. I remember everybody was uh, obeying everything that the government would ask them to do. We pulled the curtains at night so no light was shining out. Uh, gas rationing had started. Sugar rationing had started. Um, of course, in those days, most of us all had a, a small garden anyway, but uh, people were doing more and more of their own uh, production of fruits and vegetables at home. Unfortunately, uh, when I was in high school, for two years, I. I had uh, a bad condition with my uh, ears and uh, had two operations. And my father said, you'll never be drafted because you're not well enough. And my mother was completely frightened and that uh, I was going to be leaving home as her only child. And so I went down anyway and answered the call. Mm -hmm passed the physical and was drafted into the service. I went to Syracuse. My parents took me to Syracuse, and we departed by bus from there mm -hmm. to uh, uh, Fort Niagara. I really don't recall anything that my dad or, or mother said. Um, my mother was very upset uh, mm -hmm. and very frightened. I remember that. Sure. At, Okay, so you're on your way to Fort Niagara by um, bus. Tell us a little bit about your first impressions of uh, entering the um, basic training. or Tell us about that. I was pretty naive, like everybody else. When everybody barked, I jumped and uh, did everything that they said to do. And I was only in Fort Niagara very, just a very few days. It uh, was extremely cold, I remember that. It was very, very cold, and I was on KP duty in the kitchen, and all of a sudden they came up and said to me, get back to your barracks and get ready, you're shipping out. And so back I went and packed my duffel bag and, and waited for the call. So they sent us to uh, Camp Croft, South Carolina, for basic training. Went by train. Yeah. Very dirty, very crowded. 
I don't remember as it being that long. It, uh, time went quite fast. Yeah. It may have been over. I'm sure it was overnight and mm -hmm. the train. You know, no beds or bunks or anything. Well, again, everybody was yelling at you, so you just fell in line and they assigned you to a unit and equipped you with more clothing and sent you to your barracks and you met your drill sergeant and, and you just started to drill. I, I can't remember that we did a lot of combat training that would have helped during the war. I, I can remember that we did a lot of short order marching and we would do uh, long hikes and things and we had some bayonet training where we would hit dummies with the bayonet then we would crawl under machine gun fire and which the guns of course were all mounted so the bullets weren't coming close to but you. But they were real planes. bullets flying over your head? I have no idea really if they were real or not. I, I don't remember hearing anything so I always <laughs> thought in my mind that they were blanks. Then we had gas mask training where they put you in the room and you got to put the mask on and and then breathe into the mask for a while and then they'd let you out. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the training afterwards and really didn't do much good. good yeah. for, really didn't make any friends in, in Camp Croft. There was a, just a, such a short time. I had some buddies that you hung out with and we didn't really have a lot of free time. I can remember going into uh, the, the village uh, there and it was really the first time I, I was aware of uh, how the uh, black people were treated that, because they had white and black drinking fountains and black and white bathrooms and I can remember walking down the street in Spartanburg, South Carolina and if there were a group of African Americans on the street uh, they would get off to the sidewalk and let you through. They, it had to be quite a shock to you coming from the north. It was a big shock right? to me to, to see that as a young person. I, I didn't realize that was going on in the world. Hmm. I saw one elderly man on a probably a 10 or 11 year old boy just yelling and screaming in his face and I don't think he did anything that that serious. Well we left Camp Croft and went up by train up to uh, Indian Town Gap, uh, Pennsylvania. That was our port of departure and uh, they bust us from uh, Indian Town Gap, they bust us to New York City and we got on a troop ship and and went to Europe. All right, so where did they take you in Europe? Where was the first stop? Well, our, uh, I think our route went pretty much along the coast uh, towards South America because we had air cover as well as uh, ships. And then we crossed and went through the uh, uh, Gibraltar and uh, we landed in Oran, Africa. Did you get any specialized training along the way or you pretty much trained as an infantryman and that was your job? No, we were just cannon fodder. We were, <laughs> we were replacements for the guys that had been wounded or mm -hmm. killed or captured. The physical training was was easy. You were in pretty good shape yes. then, probably. No, I don't know if I was in that good a shape, but it, we really didn't do anything. I mean, it didn't, didn't seem like we were doing yeah. much at all. They had a lot of casualties in the African campaign, and they needed yeah. new, new blood. All right, so, you, so you've landed in Africa. Um, just, let's walk through it kind of chronologically, as you recall it. Tell us what was your first uh, mission, your first duty. Well, as soon as we landed on Iran, they put us on what they called the uh, 40 and 8 cars. They, I think they held 40 people and 12 cows. And um, uh, the, the car I was in was, uh, was really very full, and I was one of the last ones in. 
And uh, I remember, particularly at, at night or if I started to get a little drowsy, that I'd have to pull the door shut so it'd be up against my knees and my body so I didn't tumble out of the, out of the car. These are rail cars? These are rail cars yeah. that we were going across towards the uh, Cape Bond Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite a few days. At least it seemed like quite a few days at the time. Yeah. I, I know one time I thought, maybe if I get out of this thing and I'll go up, there's a little seat up where the, the brakes were on the car. But I got up there and there was already an Arab <laughs> hmm. in place there. So I had to... I had to forego that idea and come back down. So I remember all we got were C rations along the way. That was it. They were for me. They were too greasy, but it, it was uh, better than better than nothing, I guess. But uh, you could survive on them, all right. They had a lot of what kind of things were they always the same? By the way, the pretty same much kind? all the same. Yeah, what, the, what was in three there? Three different. I think there were three different flavors, and I've kind of forgotten what they were. But uh, so you had what a potted meat of some kind? Yeah, or? yeah, one of them had meat in it and tasted like spam a little bit. And, I don't know. I've kind of forgotten, but I remember they were they were kind of greasy <laughs> going down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you get hungry enough, though, you probably oh, yeah. eat, eat it. it well, they used to have a little small chocolate bar in them too, which was. Kind of ironic because I, uh, before I went in the service, I was uh, a candy packer for four or five months at uh, the Chocolate Works in Fulton, New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, the line I was working on, we were doing those bars. So Oh, interesting. I might have packed my own bar, I don't know. Yeah. What was the name of the, the chocolate com company? Was it, it ultimately became part uh, of Nestle's, was it? It was the Peter Kaler Kohler Chocolate Company it was a Swiss company. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very productive company mm -hmm. at the time. We were headed to the towards the uh, Cape Bond Peninsula, and the Germans uh, had fled Africa, but the, by that time, and they'd set up a, some kind of a command post so that when we got off the train, uh, we went in, and there was. A couple of gentlemen at the desk, and and uh, they would ask you, uh, "Do you want to be a a rifleman? Do you want to be a machine gunner? Do you want to be a mortar man, or what?" I he was kind of serious, and I told him, "I said I'd I'd like to be a I'd like to be in the Air Force." And I can remember him put down his pen, and he started laughing. <laughs> so I told him, I said, I'll be an infantryman. So I was assigned to an infantry unit. They sent me to the uh, to Sicily. Uh, Americans had already landed there and had captured most of the country. And I was assigned to the uh, 157th Infantry 2nd Battalion, Company G, and got off the truck and they met us, the sergeant met us and said, get your rifle and bring your stuff and come with me. And we went up under a big old lemon tree. It was hotter than blue blazes. And he said, uh, we're making a landing behind the German lines tonight. He said, and we've got to go through the, how to get your pack and rifle and things uh, situated right. So if you get dumped in the water, you be upright rather than upside down. The, the life preservers that we had were those one belt that went around your waist, and they had a couple of air cartridges. And if you got in the water, why well, you you blew them. But if you if they weren't put on right, you went upside down rather than stand being upright. So mm -hmm. that was my my first training of how to do it, and then we. Came back from there and jumped on trucks, and they took us to a port, and we jumped on the boat and landed behind the German lines that what? night. I was like everybody else; I, I just obeyed commands and went. But I was, I was a little apprehensive because you never know what's going to happen. 
The U.S. Army's 157th Infantry Regiment first committed to battle on the 10th of July, 1943, in the assault wave of landings on the island of Sicily. Though enemy resistance was light, 27 men were drowned in the landings. Among the first to die were four resolute machine gunners who held their positions onto death to keep a German counterattack from overrunning a withdrawing rifle company. A week later, the 157th, which Sparky was a member of, conducted another landing on Sicily in an operation to leapfrog up the coast to bypass heavy defenses. During this operation, a landing craft loaded with men broke free from the ship's davits and dropped on top of another loaded landing craft that had come alongside the ship. 21 men were killed in this single mishap. Next, Sparky and the 157th participated in the assault landings on mainland Italy near the town of Salerno, south of the famed Amalfi Coast. They came ashore on the 10th of September, 1943, and were immediately met by heavy German resistance, battling at such places as the Tobacco Warehouse, which changed hands four times, Persamo, and the Sele River. The first landing we made was with a, with a ship, and uh, we had to uh, go down the ropes. Uh, they threw the ropes over, and then you jumped into the boat. And, but you had to make sure that because uh, the waves would take the boat away from the, from the ropes, and if you uh, didn't time it right, the boat you missed, the boat would come back and smack you, mm -hmm. drown you, kill you, one or the other. Of course, everybody's in a hurry, and they're stepping on your hands and whatever, but uh, I managed to get in the boat with no problem. And Oh, this was, uh, this was a night landing mm -hmm. that we had. Okay. I've forgotten what time it was. Now, you're getting into a Higgins boat, or what type of craft were you well, getting? Well, a Higgins boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that the first time you had been in a Higgins That's boat? That's the first time. Okay, so not a lot of training with the Higgins boat, obviously. Oh, no, it was like no, uh, on-the-job training. No training at all. It was just You were a replacement. You were a casualty replacement is what you were. Mm -hmm. uh, I would guess there were probably 25 to 30, mm -hmm. all crowded in, crouched down, of course, and waiting for it to hit the beach and drop the front of it. We were quite close, uh, I would say maybe three or 400 yards. It was quiet, and you're just, you're nervous, and because you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know if you're going to be fired upon or what's going to happen. I well, imagine. there's there's no atheists in foxholes. Or in Higgins or boats, in I guess, Higgins right? Higgins boats or in combat. Uh, uh, I had a good religious background when I was growing up, and I believed in the Lord, and uh, it affirmed my faith more mm -hmm. the longer I was in, in the service, I can tell you that. Well, we were very fortunate because uh, the, uh, the Germans had, had fled. They were gone. Well, that's a good thing. So that was a good thing, and uh, so we just rushed ashore and went to the positions that we were supposed to, and and uh, they gathered us together, and and uh, there was no opposition, so we just stayed there in the in the in a company group. It was uh, near near Palermo. We well, once we landed and uh, behind, and the the Germans had fled, they put us all back together again, and and. Uh, they had one meeting and said, get ready because we're going to make another landing behind the German lines. So a couple of days later, we went again. And uh, this time I was on a, uh, a ship, uh, I've kind of forgotten the names of them, but had a couple of runways down. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was a little exciting uh, on that trip because uh, we were running at night and uh, we collided with another ship. I was I was way in the back. Of course, the stairway is so narrow to go down and up. There was only one way, and um, 
myself along with a dozen other guys, we got, you know, thrown out on the floor and we're crawling around each other and you're looking up and I'm just looking up and I'm saying, it's all over, I'm going to drown, there's no way I'm going to get out of this boat, you know. Mm. And it was nice to hear somebody finally come to the top and say, we're okay. So, so the vessels were both viable after the collision. They both yes, both were boats fine. were. Fortunately, they they collided this way. Just kind of bounced and, off um, each other. But just bumped into each other hard. Right. And go. Well, Any concept of how many vessels of that size were in this particular landing? I was aware of maybe three or four is all. There may have been more. There may have been. Yeah. All I knew is that we were gonna. We we were still. Uh, Below Palermo, and we were gonna we were gonna make another landing behind mm -hmm. the German lines, uh, but this one was uh, not only with the ships colliding, but when we landed, we were in a minefield, and uh, fortunately, we got through it. Uh, I don't recall anybody getting getting hurt, but uh, you had to be very. How did careful. they get you through the minefield? Did they have somebody looking for the mines, or how did? I'm they... sure they probably had. They made a mine sweepers going yeah. ahead, yeah. and uh, so when we're, we came along, they they just kept we're in a minefield, so be very careful. Was there any naval bombardment in advance of your landing? We had no bombardment at all. Went just in there. an infantry landing behind the line. Okay. All right. So yeah. did you meet opposition at that point, or tell us? No about opposition. It? Just just the minefield. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate. Yeah. Okay. How long did they have you stay there? Well, the war, the war ended because the Germans uh, uh, evacuated back to Italy, mm -hmm. the southern part of Italy, and uh, then we patrolled. The beaches were absolutely gorgeous in Sicily, mm -hmm. and uh, I think our our walk was maybe between two and four miles at night, and we'd have to walk back and forth and patrol the beach mm -hmm. because they thought they'd probably counterattack and come back, but that didn't happen. Never happened, okay. So now they're probably no longer on Sicily at all. Um, where, where were you headed next? Well, after we completed the Sicilian campaign, then they invaded uh, Italy, Salerno. Well, we landed in uh, it didn't have any problem getting ashore. We had a lot of bombardment, naval ships. I can remember it seemed like the grass would, when they shells would go over, would almost lay down flat. And, and uh, we did have a lot of opposition. And there was quite a lot of severe fighting mm -hmm. all the way. And uh, we finally got in you know, towards the... Uh, bottom of the mountains and through Naples and after we got through the the Salerno campaign it was winter time and I can remember we we're being in them you know in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So at Salerno how, how many days did it take to to secure your objective at Salerno and well it was, it was, it was quite a while because that fighting was, was uh, the Germans weren't going to give up easily. Of course, they never did. They, they were a little fanatics. Did they times. have fixed positions overlooking the beach? Oh, they did, yes. And what kind of equipment did they use and techniques? Well, I think the things I remember the most were they had a, a weapon called the Screamin' Mimi, and it fired about six uh, mortar shots all at the same time, and of course, they were very dangerous. Gee, they hit the ground and splinter all over the place. And they had the the eighty eight gun, which was uh, a, a terrific weapon for them. And they also had the uh, the burp gun, as we called, like our Tommy gun. And uh, they used it. But the Germans were tenacious mm -hmm. fighters. They they did not give up easily at all. Oh yes, yeah. We had we had several casualties. So we got into the mountains and Salerno. That was uh, 
the, the war kind of hit, a, hit what you'd, I guess you'd call it a dead spell. Um, it, was, it was really too cold to fight, and everybody was, was cold. There was winter time, and as I can remember, we used to have, we'd have eight days on the front, and we'd have four days in reserve, but we were high up. And uh, the trail was very, very narrow. And we had, uh, you couldn't dig. You'd have to take your shelter half and combine it with somebody else and put it between rocks and boulders and things. And they would send us out on patrol. Most every night you'd be out on patrol looking. They always wanted you to get a prisoner. They'd always call you down and say, get us a prisoner. Which was pretty hard to do, mm -hmm. but you could hear them. Every night you could hear them, the Germans sinking mines in. You could hear them jingling and jangling down there. Yeah. And I can remember one night uh, I had to relieve myself. And when we first went in there, uh, we didn't have very good equipment in terms of, of warmth. We had the old heavy wool coats and things. And we finally got what they call a tanker suit, which was pretty nice. It had was zippered up and you get into it, it was warm, but uh, I can remember coming back in after relieving myself and I, my hands were so cold I couldn't zip up my zipper. I had to ask my, my foxhole buddy to zip up my my suit for me because I just couldn't make I couldn't make my fingers work. Wow. We had a lot of illness. Um, we that was when trench foot started to come up. Nobody'd heard about that before. What is? Can you describe trench foot for us? What are the What are the symptoms of trench foot? Uh, it, it came as a result of getting your feet wet, and your feet would would swell completely mm -hmm. up. If you took your shoes off, you wouldn't get them back on again. Mm -hmm. So pretty it, much left your shoes on all the time. Were there any problems with gangrene as a result of that? I or? don't recall anybody having gangrene, but I, all I know is uh, they were, we, were, we were short of men, and I wound up as a, an assistant squad leader, and we were so high up that the mules couldn't get where we were. Uh, we'd have to, uh, I'd have to go down to where the mules could get to and uh, bring up water and ammunition and what have, mm -hmm. whatever. And then we were always helping somebody that was either sick or had trench foot and help them get down to a mule and get them on the mule and put them back down. The trails were extremely narrow and slippery. And sometimes the mules would even fall oh. off of them. It was brutal cold. Yeah. And then, of course, at that time, when we'd be up eight days, we'd come back for four. It was raining and down below the mountains. And it was just, I mean, the mud was unbelievable. It would be up to the hubcaps on the trucks and jeeps and things. Hmm. So we were always sleeping in the wet. And it was cold and damp. Were you getting any hot meals at this point? When you were uh, when you were down at the uh, the base, yeah, you'd get a warm meal from the kitchen, mm -hmm. which was nice. Yeah. How how was the food out in the field when they were cooking it for you? Pretty good. I thought it was delicious because you get anything compared to sea rations was a lot better than, uh -huh. than that. Yeah. yeah. We were in there uh, pretty much all winter long. Um, probably, pardon me, November, December, January, hmm. February. And then uh, the uh, when spring started to come, they, they asked us to attack this mountain. Uh, I remember the name of it uh, very well, Tenton. And... It was uh, 
it was very steep and very rocky. You, you, you know, you, you couldn't climb it straight up. You had to go. Switchbacks. Switch back and forth. Yeah. And a buddy of mine, he was a little older than I was, was quite a little older, actually. He's about 10 years older than I was. He was the lead scout, and I was the second scout. And, of course, old nimble foot here, we got almost to the top, and I, I was dark. We, it was dark when we left and to attack, and I hit this stone, and it started to roll and make noise, and uh, we were right by a, a German outpost, and he threw a grenade, and fortunately, he threw it between us, <laughs> so <laughs> neither one of us got hurt, but uh, the, the top of the mountain was very flat, and the Germans had a machine gun on that side one on that, a crossfire, and uh, we couldn't get over that. There was no way we could get over the top of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were laying there, and, and uh, they threw air bursts on us all day long, and they were tossing mortars. And I remember there was one, one gentleman laying next to me. I didn't say anything to him. He didn't say anything to me either. And, we were just kind of guarding the flanks of of our attacking unit, and they finally said, uh, Sergeant called to me, and he said, uh, Rector, I want you to go with that machine gunner over there, farther out on the flank. I said, okay, and I reached over to shake this guy, and he said, my sergeant said, well, don't bother, he's dead. The poor guy had taken a bullet through the head, and somebody pulled the his cap down. We had wool cap, and they pulled it down over his hmm. face. I didn't even realize it. I just laying there. Well, I don't mean to be cold-hearted, and but it's it's just it just happens, you yeah. know. It could happen to you at most any time. Mm -hmm. But they put us all out on. They put a lot of us out on the flanks around the mountain and all the way down the hill, and the mountain, whatever. and So finally they came and they took the machine gunner away from me and they told me to stay there, and I did. So I was there all night. This was early in the morning when we jumped off, like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. The night came and I'm still there. I don't see anybody. So dawn came and I'm still there and I don't see anybody. And I said, something's wrong here. So I took the safety off my rifle and I started down the mountain and I started going more towards the center. And it was pretty dusk and I, I saw this figure coming towards me and he didn't see me. So I, I stayed behind this big boulder and kept an eye on him. And he kept coming, so it was one of our guys. So here's the two of us. So we were at the very top. And uh, so we both started down then. And eventually, we got down below. There were, there were 12 of us. And they'd left us there. They forgot us. Hmm. So we got to the bottom, and we formed a little uh, area of our own to guard. So we... We took turns, we put, it was kind of a dry little river bottom, and so we put one one guy on each end of it, and the rest of us went and got a little sleep, and then when, when they got tired, they'd come over and wake us up, and then we'd do it. And then when night came, we, uh, normally in those days, uh, they laid uh, a telephone wire, and uh, we found the end of the wire, and so we followed that backwards. And again, we were lucky. We came up on our own outpost. How long was that wire? I mean, how far away was the wire well, strung it, out? Well, it goes from the, from the command post all the way up because that, that was the only communications they had except those little radios we used to put over our, our shoulder, which mm -hmm. is another story. They, they, weren't, uh, they weren't that good. So they always had a, a wire to lay, but it led right back to the uh, 
outpost. There was a heavy machine gun, and they challenged us, which was good. They didn't fire first. <laughs> what was the challenge? Tell us how the procedure of verifying identities. They'd yell, halt. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you say? And they'd want the password. We said, we don't have the password. <laughs> <laughs> so how'd you convince him? <laughs> then one of us went up, and and uh, they uh, looked us over and said okay, and they let us through. Mm. And we got back uh, to our company. We were very very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're still you're still at Salerno, correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, after the spring came, and then they, they broke out, and uh, of course there were other divisions involved in it too, and ours was pulled back. They sent us back to Naples, mm -hmm. and they said we were going to have more amphibious training and go. I don't ever remember any amphibious training, but okay. it sounded good. Yeah. But we got uh, nice warm meals, and we were in. Okay, so let's take it from when you got to Naples. Tell us a little bit about what you did in, in Naples. Well, we got back to Naples, and uh, we were in a big bivouac area, and uh, I was uh, assigned to be a runner to deliver messages from our company headquarters back to the the battalion, and my buddy, my tent buddy, he was a had the same position that I did. Uh, they had a huge uh, uh, stage behind us. Uh, just so happened that we were put at the back of the of the of the area. No particular reason, just the luck of the draw. So um, Naples was open, and uh, so we used to uh, figured out we could take turns. We could go a wall, so one day I would take off and go to Naples and do what I wanted to do, and I got some nice black market dinners, uh, beef. I guess it was beef. Could have been horse meat, but they tasted very good, and uh, of course, lots of wine with the dinner. And I'd come back, and then my buddy would go the next day. Well, one day the the payroll came in, and my buddy was had gone AWOL. That was his day to go to Naples. And so I I tried to hide as much as I could all day long because they called me down and said to uh, sign the payroll. I said, okay, and they said, Make sure you send Weaver down. I said, okay. So I went back, and I tried to hide all day, but they kept pestering me to get Weaver. And finally, my first sergeant, he called me down, and he said, where's Weaver? <laughs> so I, I said, by then I knew that Weaver had been caught by the MPs in, a, in an area that he shouldn't be in. <laughs> <laughs> so... Poor Weaver, he uh, was put in jail down there. And of course, the Germans had very few airplanes left, but they would come over at night and bomb, and and uh, they'd take them out of the jail and take them into some kind of a a tunnel area. But Weaver said the the, the worst part was they they roll the sea rations in under the bars <laughs> to, for him to eat. <laughs> And when he came back, he had to he had to dig a seven by seven garbage pit. <laughs> and I can remember the, the sergeant said, "Why weren't you down there?" And I said, "Well, it's not my day <laughs> to go." So we had a big laugh about that. So, what kind of things did you do in Naples that um, you can tell us about? <laughs> Besides, have dinner. <laughs> well, poor Weaver, he went in the wrong place. Um, a lot of them were, there was a lot of venereal disease, of course, and mm -hmm. uh, you really had to stay away from that malarkey. But uh, there were some nice uh, things to see. There was uh, an old uh, 
uh, architecture and uh, uh, paste them. Some of it hadn't been completely uh, destroyed and uh, by age in a historic place. And there were a lot of nice places in, in Naples that you could go and have a you know have a good day. You'd, you'd have to take a winding route off around because the black market uh, was functioning well in mm -hmm. terms of food and things, but it was costly, but who cared? You weren't going to need the money anyway. So, <laughs> How did the, the people food. treat you, the Italians, when you were there? They were, they were fine. So I think not... they were happy to see Mussolini go. Yeah. Uh, I know a bar of soap or a piece of soap would get you anything you wanted from the women. Mm. If, if, if you had it extra smokes and things. Yeah. Remember the kids, uh, if we were if we were in our chow line and you were coming through and you had food left over, they all had a can. They'd take your leftover food mm -hmm. as, as quick as anything. I saw one guy liberate a chicken and he, he just deheaded it by twisting it and he threw that away. And Christ, about three guys were climbing over each other to get that head just to put it in water and boil it and make make the soup taste a little better than water. Yeah, know? so they were pretty hungry. Oh, yeah. They didn't have much food for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Felt bad for the kids. It's there. Well, felt bad for all of them, really, but the children in particular. You hate to see kids eat garbage, but... Sure. When you get hungry, you'll do anything. Yeah. In late October 1943, the Allied advance following the Salerno invasion was proving so arduous due to poor weather, rough terrain, and stiffening resistance that General Dwight D. Eisenhower pessimistically told the Anglo-American Combined Chiefs of Staff that there would be very hard and bitter fighting before the Allies could hope to reach Rome. To avoid a costly struggle for every ridge and valley, the Allies decided to land at Anzio because it was considered the best site within striking distance of Rome, but still within range of Allied aircraft operating from Naples. The initial beachhead was to be 15 miles wide by 7 miles deep. The entire region was part of an elaborate reclamation and resettlement project that had been undertaken by Mussolini to showcase fascist agricultural improvements and was studded with pumping stations and farmhouses and crisscrossed by irrigation ditches and canals. The Allied invasion of Anzio began at 0200 on the 22nd of January 1944 and achieved one of the most complete surprises in history. It took a week for the Germans to organize a counterattack, by which time Allied troops had consolidated their positions and were prepared to break out of the beachhead. The next four months would see some of the most savage fighting of World War II. We had a few meetings, and I remember General Patton coming in and talking to the non-commissioned officers and and the commissioned officers and of course the sirens are going and he's standing up in his vehicle as he comes through and that was kind of impressive to see that. I can remember him saying uh, to the non-commissioned officers, he said when we hit the beach, he said some of them are going to go forward some of them are going to go backwards, shoot the bastards. Oh, I said, oh, I guess I just better crawl a little bit forward all the time then for this. But uh, I don't remember that we had a lot of training on getting on ships and running ashore or anything. We just were bivouacked there, and then all of a sudden they, they told us uh, in a meeting that we were going to we were going to land behind the German lines again, so we uh, got on the ships and 
we were in the harbor for about three days. They would, they'd let you, they'd let you swim, but you can imagine the water was all oily and you didn't have enough water for a shower. So that really didn't turn me on too much. I think I could save that time for something better. So we'd have, we'd have meetings and my particular area where we were going, they, they told us there was a big seawall and that the torpedo boys were going to come in and they were going to blow a hole in it and we could go through the wall. So off we go and we sailed up and uh, got off the ships and into the Bacon's boats and we were running around and all of a sudden somebody blows the horn and we took off to the beach. And our particular boat, we hit a, we hit a sandbar, we probably were a good hundred yards offshore. And I can remember we all turned to the, the boatsman and said, "Gun it!" So he did, and we, we went through the sandbar, and we went right up on the beach. I didn't even get the soles of my shoes wet. Hmm. We run off, and sure enough, there's the hole. We, we ran through the hole. There was a big firefight on our left, a big firefight on our right, but my unit, we just took off straight. It made me a little nervous because I didn't know who was on my left and who was on my right, but uh, we, uh, we went through Anzio and, and uh, took off, and the Germans were retreating. Was that on day one of Anzio? That was or the first day of first Anzio, day. yeah. They... That was a particularly bloody engagement, as uh, yeah, I recall. It, it was. Uh, we got off and we went into the what they called the caves. They were big talk caves. And we had to carry ammunition and water and everything in. But uh, the British had landed and they'd gotten almost to Rome. Then the Germans attacked with like 10 divisions and uh, they had all the all the high ground and i know when we were walking in you couldn't hit the you couldn't hit the ground because you could see the tracer bullets coming you could hear them they'd be stomping at your feet and some british guy came up to me i was walking along and he said he said laddie don't uh, don't walk in the in the road he said because it's all mined all the way up through, and uh, so we got into the we got into the caves there with uh, with my unit. The Germans attacked and attacked and attacked. It got it got pretty rough. They uh, we had our own artillery. Captain Robinson he he had our our own artillery shelling on top of us because. The Germans were all around. Eventually, we got, we were cut off for three days. We didn't have any, any water. We didn't have any food except what we had with us. I can remember being with one of our, our machine gunners, and I can still see them. There was a, a German machine gun crew. Why they ever did it, I don't know, but they stood up and they, they ran. He just cut them down like 10 pins, boom, boom, boom. They just went like boiling pins. They were just toppled. So uh, I was guarding a hole, and uh, it was a small hole, not probably five or six feet. And I said, can't too many people come through there at one time. So instead of staying near the hole, I, I went back about 15 yards and stayed behind it and uh when i was up by the hole i could hear the i could hear them putting the shell in their their 88 to shoot down through the holes and things and uh so i said i think i'd better get out of here quick and two guys came along and they said oh we're going up there i said if i were you i think i'd stay back here well one blast came and they both got wounded and they had to get out of there and 
be evacuated back in the cave, so they had a medical unit back there. And I, uh, I was still guarding the hole, and my platoon officer came along, and they said, Rector, they said, you got to get this message and take it back to headquarters. So I said, okay. So I'm, I'm going back, but huge chunks of this talk would fall from the ceiling down. I mean, huge From the chunks. concussion of the... Yeah, from the shelling, because they were <clears throat> shelling us on top, the Germans as well as us. And uh, was lucky to get back without getting knocked in the noggin with one of those. And while I was gone, my platoon was captured. Hmm. So back in there again, I came back. And, of course, I was attached to a squad there. And so we fought through that. And finally, they decided to evacuate the caves and get out. Well, we had quite a lot of wounded, and our medical officer, Captain Graffadino, he said, I don't want to leave the wounded. So we, we put the ones that could walk together, and then we put some guys on stretchers, and we had four guys to a stretcher. We got out about 50 yards, maybe, and the shelling was was so intense that we had to take and come come back in with them. Then it was like they said, every man for himself. Graffadino, Dr. Graffadino would leave them. So he stayed and they were all captured. I can remember just take taking off and hurtling barbed wire and everything else and they were shooting and shelling and they were dropping flares and there were some like haystacks and they set those on fire and we were illuminated by them but fortunately I got back and dug a hole and and they re refilled all our our ranks again with uh, replacements. And then we were dug in. Of course, it was a perimeter there, like, like a half moon. And you can remember staying in the holes, and you couldn't, you couldn't dig down very deep because of, it was, uh, Anzio was very low, and you know, you'd get water. And if you wanted to relieve yourself during the day, you know, you kind of had to take your helmet off and take the helmet liner out and then slide it under your rear end like you're getting on a bedpan and then dump it out and uh, take a little water and clean out the helmet and go on your way. I remember they, they ran horses over us one time. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. And then one day they ran sheep over us in the front lines. And, of course, they were laying mines all the time. There wasn't a lot of activity. I don't remember they sent us out on, pardon me, on patrols at all. But there was constant shelling. And then one day, I have no idea why they did it, but they uh, wanted our platoon to move and they moved us in the daylight. And uh, my platoon officer gave me one of those radios. And he and I were together. And uh, we started out 15 paces apart walking. And uh, oh, they just shelled the daylights out of us. And uh, I can remember we came to a a little spot in the road, and it was just kind of a little knoll. And I think we, we heard the shell at the same time, the both of us, and we, we hit the ground, but the shell hit just beyond us and went, went that way. But it was enough force that it picked both of us up and slammed us to the ground. Well, that was, that was too close for comfort, but 
it was well after dark before we got everybody in the company together because my radio wouldn't work more than probably 200 yards away from anybody. But why they ever moved us, I, I don't know to this day, but we finally got them together and that was it. And the poor officer, he was, he was pretty worn out. His terrific responsibility to, to have a platoon of guys. And he went down the aid office and they, they put him on a ship and sent him back. And I can remember about a month later, he came back and I heard he was back there. So I went down and I remember he said to me, he said, Rector, you're still here. I said, yeah, Lieutenant, I am. I'm still here. But his, his nerves were gone. He was shaking. And uh, so they put him on a boat and sent him back and reassigned him someplace else, I'm sure. I had an acquaintance in New Haven, American Legion, who was uh, uh, worked on freighters. And, of course, all the, all the supplies were brought in by, by ship, but there was no docks. So they had to use the, the duck boats. And I know he, he used to tell me, I'd see him every once in a while, and he'd say, oh, he said, I couldn't wait to get away from that Enzo. He said, they kept, they kept shelling us all the time down there. I said, yeah, they sure did. <laughs> but they had, a, they had a place for, that had quite a lot of trees on it. And they, uh, they took a bulldozer and they drove it down in and they made a, like a little movie theater. So every once in a while we'd, we'd have a movie we could go to if you were in the reserve unit and pull back. They could you'd go to a movie. But how long did, were you at Anzio? How long did it last? Uh, it was around three months we were there before they jumped off. It wasn't a lot of fighting. It was just a lot of shelling. And they had the high ground. They had all Monte the high Casino ground. And the Monte Casino Abbey. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. that. But they had a they had a huge railroad gun up there. And uh, honestly, God, it sounded that shell sounded like a box car going end over end when it was in the air. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. But it would blow a t t terrific hole in the ground. Mm. Unbelievable. And then, of course, they had to break out eventually in the spring. And uh, so they used to have what we call the turkey shoot. Everybody get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you'd fire everything you had. Hmm. And uh, it would last maybe 45 minutes to an hour, and then, then it would quit. And... and uh, Nobody did anything. Everybody was nervous and jerky. So that went on for three or four days, and then finally they they told they told us we were going to jump off and attack, and uh, and we did. And uh, I remember we started out, and I uh, had a couple of my buddies. One was from Schenectady, and young guy by the name of Franklin, and. Another kid from Ohio by the name of Weaver, who was really a nice kid, too. And uh, we took off, and we probably got a couple hundred yards out, and the fire was, was, uh, was really bad, really tough. It was everything. So we just happened to come on a hole, and um, we jumped into it. And uh, my platoon officer came along, and... He could have said either one of the names, but he said, Rector, get out. He said, you got to get this message and take it back to headquarters. I said, okay, so I'm, I'm going backwards, and there's still its bullets are flying all over the place and mortar fire and artillery and the, and the whole bet. And then my, I'd be passing some guys, and they'd say, get down, get down, what are you doing? And I said, well, I got to get this message back so I got the message back but unfortunately while I was gone my two buddies got hit either by a, an artillery shell or they got hit by a, a mortar and both of them were killed 
I didn't find that out till in the in the evening, and that uh, that was kind of shock. And I I I think of them every every day. I say a little prayer for them. They're good guys. So we continued the attack, and we went all all the way up to Rome. We got to, we got to Rome, and and. Uh, had a little bivouac area. The war was over for us. There were other units that continued on in the north, and uh, we were stopped there, which was uh, nice. And uh, that's, as a matter of fact, I got a picture out of it for my little little bivouac area I had with some straw or hay thrown over the top of it. But uh, there were very few airplanes then that the Germans had. But uh, our Air Force was uh, unbelievably strong up at uh, Anzio all the time we were there. I, I know I saw two or, two or three bombers that, were, that just got a direct hit in a gas tank or something. They just, boom, it just exploded. There were, there were no parachutes, no nothing. And the fighter jets would, would come over and strafe the, the Germans. And uh, that was very impressive. We were we were delighted to see the Air Force. They did a great job helping us. But while I was in Rome, and after things had settled down, and um, they'd give us passes to to go into Rome, and uh, that was was a beautiful uh, beautiful place to visit. I. Uh, I just missed an audience with the Pope by about five minutes, uh, but I was in the Sistine Chapel and, and uh, went through all the, the old Colosseum because uh, now they have boardwalks through, but we could, we could walk right through on the ground where they kept all the animals and the gladiators and the whole bit. It was, a, it was really interesting. And I went to Pompeii. They were... They had already started to evacuate that. And that was very interesting to see. Uh, even now, not an opera person, but uh, I went to an opera there, and that was a, that was really really a fun thing. I enjoyed it because they, the real opera fans are kind of fanatic, and when the soprano sings and does such a great job they were all standing up and clapping and and yelling soprano soprano and so i knew if something good was happening i didn't understand it but uh, they did that was that was good and uh then we saw a wonderful show by uh irving berlin put on a a big show in uh that was a fantastic show. Give us an idea of the time frame. What year, what month and year about are you in now? Oh, uh, it would be in, um, it'd be 43. It'd be probably uh, July, August in, in that area. Mm -hmm. Then we were pulled back again, of course. They took us, <clears throat> took us back to Naples and we were supposed to get more amphibious training. I don't remember all the training, but... Maybe we got it. And then, of course, they, in the meetings, they told us we were going to, going to invade Europe, Southern Europe. So away we go again. And uh, so we got uh, on the boats and landed. I landed in St. Raphael, which was a, and still is a big, uh, resort area and uh we had very little difficulty just a couple of big firefights on my left and right and the germans were retreating and they'd fight like crazy for two or three days and then they'd all of a sudden they'd just pull up and go out and then they'd be chasing them we seemed like we were walking 20 miles every day did they have much help from their air force at this point, or what was? Nah, not very, very little. So we controlled the skies. Yeah, 
I can remember the first uh, the first jet they had. It was a very bright day, and all of a sudden, our, we had a group of bombers going over and uh, just kind of heard a whoosh, and geez, you looked, and here comes one of our bombers tumbling down. And uh, I'd never seen anything like that before, heard anything. It was so fast yeah. compared to what we had. But fortunately, they didn't have very many, which was good. If they'd have got that, would have probably been a longer war. Yeah. Well, we kept chasing them, and they kept retreating. And uh, we seemed to uh, be off to the, uh, the right side of southern France. We went up more towards the uh, border of Switzerland. There was quite a lot of opposition at, at, at some of the, the towns and things that we ran into. Uh, I can remember across the Durance River, and, and uh, that was like the war movie. It, it wasn't all that deep, but I remember you have, I had to hold my rifle up over my head and and because the water was up to my chest, but I'm not very tall anyway. But you know, you're soaking wet, and it was hot, and and I know I, I I kept walking, and finally I I was hurting pretty good. My my sergeant stopped me and said, "What's wrong with the erector?" And I said, that "Just that my groin area is is just." Um, all ground up, I said, <laughs> I can't, I'd have to walk and with my legs spread, it was certain, so they, she sent me to the aid office, and so I went to the aid office, and they sent me back to a, well, we hadn't, they hadn't got a hospital set up, but they were, they were setting one up, they were flying everybody out, and so I, I was on a stretcher laying there, and they were going to fly me out, but they kept getting the hospital together and so they treated me. I was there three or four days and finally it crossed it up and it came off and then I was okay again so I rejoined my unit and went up and and I don't know what happened but short time later I got uh, a bad case of dysentery and malaria and yellow jaundice all at the same oh same time. And I was I was pretty sick, and so they sent me back. And this time they put me on a a hospital ship, a British ship, and they sent me back to Africa. So I was gone about a month or more, and uh, got cured and came back. That was kind of funny too. There were Thirteen of us they put in this room. We had our bunks and at the hospital, and of course we were we were all hungry for food. And so after dinner at night, we'd uh, sneak down to the kitchen and we started raiding the refrigerators and what have you, and, and uh, we were eating the wrong foods. <laughs> that weren't good for us and so they finally they had to put a guard on, on our, <laughs> our door at night so we couldn't get out <laughs> that was kind of funny so I finally went back to my unit I can remember I was riding an old uh, Liberty ship they welded here and welded there and there was a whole lot of uh, Machinery, road machinery, out of bulldozers and road scrapers, and and uh, our bunks were down there with them. And I said, uh, if those chains break, <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to be crushed. So I I slept in a cab of one of the the road scrapers for a while at night. Hmm. Just uh. I said, I think that's a little safer than being in that bunk there. 
But they, uh, they treated us pretty nice. It was great. Every night the cook would give us some crackers and hot chocolate and things until so, we got back to land and sent back to our units. And so I got back to mine. The Siegfried Line, known in German as the Westfall, was a German defensive line built during the 1930s, opposite the French Maginot Line. It stretched more than 390 miles from Kleve on the border with the Netherlands, along the western border of Nazi Germany, to the town of Wallenbrunn on the border with Switzerland. The line featured more than 18,000 bunkers, tunnels, and tank traps. After the D-Day landings on June 1944, Hitler gave a directed for renewed construction of the Siegfried Line. 20,000 forced laborers, most of whom were 14 to 16-year-old boys, attempted to re-equip the line for defensive purposes. Even during construction, it became clear that the bunkers could not withstand the newly developed armor-piercing weapons. The 157th Infantry Regiment, first made contact with the Siegfried defense on St. Patrick's Day, 1944. Three days later, the 157th broke through. The plan for knocking out the Siegfried was simple and direct. Artillery and Air Corps hit the known gun replacements hard, keeping the pressure on while tank and infantry moved up. Tanks opened fire on bunkers and pillboxes while infantrymen crawled in under cover up to the apertures and went to work with hand grenades, flamethrowers, and demolitions. We were up towards the uh, Siegfried line by then. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it was uh, getting uh, getting winter again, B-44, the winter of 44. And uh, it was a lot of snow. And of course, it was cold. We breached the we breached the Siegfried line. There was a lot of heavy, a lot of heavy fighting there. I I still keep in contact with my my old medic. Somehow, him and I got together. I don't know how it happened, but we were in the mountains. I remember we got we got caught, and they were throwing mortars and artillery and everything. We were in the woods and uh, the shrapnel would be hitting the trees and going this way and that way. And so we saw this hole. And if you, uh, if you had any time at all and you were stalled, you could uh, get uh, uh, small logs and things and put over your hole to protect you. And uh, we both saw this hole at the same time, and I remember Joe, he ran, and he dove in ahead of me, and I followed him, but when I, when I dove, my pack came up off, and it caught on one of the top of the logs, but I'm, I'm running, but my feet are in the air. I, I wasn't hitting the ground. <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to backtrack and get off the... Get the Off get the my hook. feet back on the ground so I could get underneath. <laughs> <laughs> we laughed about that a few times. I we call each other two or three times a month and talk. What's his name? It's Joe. Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson. Where's Joe live? Joe lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Nice guy. He, as a matter of fact, I just called him just before Christmas and talked to him. He's, but he's not he's not doing well now. Unfortunately, he's got a little. Dementia, mm -hmm. but I'll keep in contact with him as long as we can yeah. do it. I I went to uh, I was fortunate enough after teaching for a long time I was inducted into the uh, National Wrestling Hall of Fame and the uh, Hall of Fame is in uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma. So I wanted to see my name on the wall. I I'd seen it on the uh, computer, but I said, I think I'd like to see it in person. So we jumped in the car and drove out there, and 
I called Joe and told him I was coming, so we got together and spent a day together mm. out there in Tulsa. That was a fun thing to do. Yeah. The, uh, we got the, we breached the Siegfried line, but what happened is they, uh, the Germans made the big counterattack <clears throat> in the north, uh, Bastogne, which was a terrible battle, I'm sure. And uh, they also attacked in the south, which didn't get a lot of publicity, but we, we retreated 10 miles one night. And uh, I had uh, two buddies, Sergeant Wims and, and uh, Carl Edwards. And uh, I kind of lost track of them after, after the war. And uh, we weren't great buddies, but we knew each other. Carl had been captured in Italy once and escaped a couple times and <laughs> recaptured. And uh, Wims, he got... Uh, I remember there was a big pillbox, and uh, we went we went by it uh, with no problem. Of course, we were we were going backwards, <laughs> probably in a hurry. And uh, Wims got captured there, and uh, I don't know. Long afterwards, a number of years afterwards, I was sitting here with them. My living room and my, I'd just gotten back from playing golf and a phone rang and I picked it up and it was uh, Carl Edwards and he said, Wims and I are sitting here, he said, in my house and he said, your name came up and he said, we wondered what you were doing. And uh, I, so we chatted a while and I talked to Wims and I said, well, I said, I have tickets to the Boston College game in about three weeks. Uh, they're playing Miami. And I said, I'll be up that way. I said, we can get together. And he said, oh, that'll be super. So we got together, the three of us, and had dinner together and shot the breeze. And unfortunately, um, within the year, both of them passed away. Hmm. So didn't get to, to see them again. But, uh, we retreated the 10 miles, and then we held our ground, and, and things got a little better, and then we started attacking again, and we went, pardon me, we went up, and, and then we kind of came back down the south. We were headed towards uh, Nuremberg and, and that way. We would come up on these little hamlets and towns and the tanks of General Patton had been ahead of us. And they'd put a tank on all four sides of the town and then take off again and go. Well, most of them gave up quite easily and, and uh, surrendered. But some of them, they, uh, they fought very diligently uh, house to house. Fortunately, I never got involved in house to house fighting, but I uh, I was by one of our 155 artillery piece, pieces one time, and I've forgotten what town it was, but I think it was a Schaffensburg, and uh, they, uh, they'd load that cannon up and uh, get the grids and fire away, and then the, the whole house would just disappear. So the, the Germans were hiding in the midst of the villages. Yeah, yeah the they were and... dug in. They were gonna. They held on to. They for some reason, a fanatical officer, and, and I believe it was a like a training area for German soldiers. So they had they had most everything they needed: food, ammunition, the whole bit. And they wanted to hold on to that town, yeah. village quite firmly, so that was pretty nasty uh, fighting there, but I was not directly involved in, in that one. Yeah, we moved on, and I can remember going into Dachau, the uh, concentration camp, and, 
e osso alla loro The town of Dachau is about 10 miles northwest of Munich in the state of Bavaria in southern Germany. In March 1933, it became the site of one of the first concentration camps built by Nazi Germany on the grounds of an abandoned munitions factory. It was initially intended to intern Hitler's political opponents, consisting of communists, social democrats, and other dissidents. After its opening by chief of German police Heinrich Himmler, its purpose was enlarged to include forced labor and eventually the imprisonment of Jews, gypsies, German and Austrian criminals, and finally foreign nationals from countries that Germany occupied or invaded. What Sparky and other members of the 157th Infantry Regiment discovered when they liberated the camp on April 29, 1945, was horrible beyond belief. Fields around the train yard littered with dead. The various gas chambers and other instruments of torture all showed signs of recent use. In one room, they found emaciated bodies stacked to the ceiling like pieces of wood waiting for disposal. As one of Sparky's colleagues wrote home, quote, no matter how terrible Revolting or horrible any newspaper accounts are about Dachau. No matter how unreal or fantastic any picture of it may seem, believe me, they can never halfway tell the truth about this place. It is something I'll never forget. You just can't believe that one human would do that to another human. Uh, the it was boxcar after boxcar of bodies just thrown into them. And Did the Germans just desert the, back yeah, out? They, there were none left there? They, yeah, they left. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we let some of them out. And then we had to regroup them, the inmates, together because they were all they were full of sores and, and malnutrition. I can remember... We threw some some biscuits from our rations out on the ground, and they were like dogs, you know. They just how many people could, do you think, how many of the inmates do you think were there at the time that you entered? I really wouldn't have any idea. That, uh, hundreds? Uh, it had to be hundreds of yeah. them. It was awful. The ovens were still, were still there. Uh, unbelievable. It's, the bodies. Fortunately, we didn't stay long. So we moved on. And, uh, of course, other units came behind to take to care of out. them and, yeah. and get them together and go. How long were you actually in the camp, do you think? I was probably there a day and a half, maybe two at the most. And your, your duties there were just to occupy this? What, what did they have you doing in that day and a half? Yeah, it's... We had to round some of them back up again and get them together so mm-hmm. they could be treated and taken care of. And but so many of them were so malnutrition they couldn't do anything anyway. Yeah. Were they? What were the reaction when they saw you come through there? Oh, they were. It's hard to explain it. It's just it was like, I guess, uh, a resurrection. They were free, and they were safe again. They weren't being misused. They were going to have food. They were going to have water. It was uh, not a good scene, not a good scene at all. How, how did you feel about it? Would you feel happy to help? What was your emotions? Well, I, was, I, was glad, I was glad that we, we got to the camp and... Freedom, just too bad that it was so late for so many of them. Mm-hmm. I've uh, been fortunate enough the two temples in Syracuse the last couple of years have asked me to come down and, and light a candle for the refugees. So I'm glad they're I'm glad they're keeping that alive for their kids, but they're having a they're having the problem too. I 
I remember this last um, fall, I was down there and a young Jewish man came up to me and said, I hate to admit it, he said, but I'm having trouble with my, my own children explaining to him what really happened. And, and that's, that's sad. Mm -hmm. Nobody should ever forget that. That was terrible. I, I, I can't believe it to this day. And I've heard people say, well, that never happened. I, it happened. At Dachau, Sparky and fellow members of the 157th Infantry Regiment saw with their own eyes how the Nazis had treated defenseless people. So they were angry when they entered the great city of Munich four days later. But they encountered a little resistance, mostly defeated-looking old men and boys who quickly surrendered and joined a long line of German prisoners. Munich had been the scene of Adolf Hitler's first bid for power in the Beer Hall Push of December 8, 1923. And now it was the scene of his army's last stand. Rumors soon reached members of the 157th that the Nazi leader was dead. The war was almost over. In its 667 days overseas, the 157th had been in battle for 470 days. And finally we got to Munich. I can remember, well, we'd be walking along and, and the, a lot of the Germans would surrender. Some kids would be up in a barn or a garage or whatever you want to call it, a house, and they'd have a white rag on a stick or something and wanted to surrender and get out of the way and you'd have to keep just waving them, waving them back, let the, let the next one mm -hmm. uh, deal with it and go. Had the Germans officially um, no. capitulated? They, so they were still they were still engaged, but weakening, obviously. Yeah, they were weakening fast by then. Had an interesting experience, too, in the mountains of, uh, in the Vosage Mountains. Uh, the, I didn't capture them, but uh, our unit captured uh, four Germans, and uh, one of them was uh, uh, shot up pretty good. And my uh, platoon officer, he said, um, it's, it's late at night, darker than hell in the forest. And he said, I want you to take these guys and take them back. Well, I'll take them back where, you know? So I got four German soldiers carrying this guy on a stretcher, and uh, I was lucky. I, I ran into a, a water truck, and they were dumping water. So I figured they had to go back where there were, where there were a lot of people. And I said, how about you guys uh, taking these blokes for me and getting them out of here? They said, no problem, put them on the truck. So we put them on the truck. And, and uh, so I went back to my unit, and a couple of days later, my first sergeant called me down to his foxhole. He said, uh, Rector, what happened to those guys? I said, beats me. I said, I ran into a water truck, and they were going back to the company, so I gave them to them. And uh, they took him back. I said, well, well, what's the big deal? He said, well, the German, the German died, and they wanted to know why. And I thought that was peculiar in the middle of a war. They'd be hmm. so concerned about one, one person dying when they were, <laughs> there were a lot of casualties that nobody cared about. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was nothing, nothing that I did to him. He just he was shot up, that's all. And, of course, medical attention wasn't that good. I had an officer uh, in one of our skirmishes that uh, got hit in the shoulder, and you never like to minimize anything, but uh, 
you know, shock killed him more than than the wound itself. And mm-hmm. That's a that's a sad thing. I'm sure things are better today medically, but you hate to see yeah. anybody with a so-called minor wound uh, have to pass away. When we got to Munich, why we kind of lived it up for four or five days. Uh, we liberated a beautiful apartment, me and two or three other guys, and we even had maid service. They come in and make up the bed every day. And there was a nice pool, and we got to do some swimming, and the attendants kept everything going for us, and that that didn't last long once they found out why we were pulled away and put back where we belonged. So how did the citizens treat you, the German citizens, the non-military folks? I mean, obviously you just had a good experience uh, in the apartment, but... Some of the, some of the citizens were, were good. Some of them were, were quite angry and upset. But mm-hmm. uh, I think by that time, they'd had enough war yeah. to... And they still hadn't... Re, um, re- they hadn't surrendered, surrendered yet. yet. No, they were still fighting. But... Uh, I think they could see the the writing on the wall. I I can remember we were pulled into one area. Our tanks were in a in a bad situation, and they wanted us to uh, stay with them and, and actually protect them, help protect them. Uh, and uh, it was maybe thirty five, forty miles from. Schweinfurt, which was a huge ball bearing producing place, and uh, the British would come over at night and they just area bomb. They just picked out a square and just drop bombs. In the, in the daytime, the Americans would come along with the Sperry bomb site, but I can remember it was it was just a cloud of dust all day long. That's all it was, and you could you could hear the rumble all the time. They just got They'd heading gone. in. Yeah. They'd, uh, Did you ever, um, were you ever in the vicinity of any of the German tanks, the Panzers or the Tigers or tanks? Um, I wasn't that close to it, but one of my uh, uh, platoon members ran up to one that thought in the dark, thought it was our tank, and it was a, a German tank. And the the guy shot. It was a single shot, but he had a a book or thick pad or something in his. We had a pocket, and it hit that, and it uh, knocked him over, but didn't kill him. He got away. Hmm. Uh, I saw our own tanks, uh, uh, not in combat, but I I saw them when they were they'd pull in and. They'd uh, want to park them for the night and, or whatever and set up an area. They didn't care if they took a building down and they'd just back it in or drive it in forward. Hmm. No, I never saw a tank battle. Yeah. Uh, just once, uh, I remember in the Vosage Mountains, they, uh, they uh, passed the word down to fix bayonets. That was... That was not a happy moment at all. Didn't want to hear that. Well, that means that the enemy's close by and they're coming at you, or you're going after them. And uh, uh, you can remember reaching back over and grabbing it and putting it on. And I said, "I'm not going to. I'm not going to enjoy this. I know that." But it, fortunately, it, uh, nothing happened, so we got out of it. I had a. I was with my squad one day in in Germany. I've forgotten where it was in the... Uh, we were behind the fence, uh, a stone wall fence, and we got pinned down. There was a machine gun nest, and we were, we were trying to get out of there and we really didn't know what to do, but I know my... <laughs> My officer said to me, he said, Rector, he said, you go over that way and crawl 
He said, and get behind that machine gun nest. I said, okay, I'll see what I can do. So I, <laughs> I started crawling, but it was all, all flat ground. There were no trees. There was no, no kind of barriers at all. And uh, I, I got maybe 10 or 12, 15 feet out from behind the fence up crawling on the ground and uh, the bullets from the machine gun are coming across my head. They're hitting in front of me on my face <laughs> in the ground. And I was probably the best words I heard was when he said, Rector, you better come back. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned around and came back. I'm no Audie Murphy. <laughs> hmm. Now, you, you received the Purple Heart. At what point did you... Um become injured to, to get well it really it really wasn't a combat situation we uh we uh, captured a small town and and uh it was a major road and um, americans were coming up and the trucks were just back to back and of course they only had those little dim lights in front of them and it was a beautiful moonlit night and so we were um couple of my buddies we we had this this house so we got we we took the house over instead of sleeping on the ground we said, oh, we'll use the house so we went outside we said geez a beautiful night we heard the airplane and we said let's let's see but so we can see that airplane and uh because he was looking for them well we got out and we were in the street and we're looking up in the beautiful well, and i could see it and all of a sudden, he opened up with the machine guns on it, and he he hit my buddy pretty good. But all I got was a little piece. I got hit by a little piece of shrapnel and in the hand, but uh, burned more than it really penetrated. Hmm. An easy way to get a Purple Heart, I guess. You got you have too to get curious, one. I guess, huh? Yeah. It was funny. Well, we saw the airplane, but it wasn't a good experience. I, I had to, I had to treat my buddy and <laughs> take his pouch off of him and the sulfur powder and all that, and and uh, get him back to the aid station. So after that, we did, we decided that wouldn't be a good thing to do anymore. So we still, the Germans still haven't surrendered at this point, correct? No, they hadn't surrendered. It went on and there was a couple of more heavy skirmishes as well. Schaffensburg was a tough fight. And then after that it kinda kinda cooled down and then they said the war is over and everybody was happy and unfortunately the a lot of them started shooting guns and anti aircraft and what have you in the air and I said what goes up must come down so there was a house nearby so I stayed in the house I said uh, mm -hmm. I'll do my celebrating in there <laughs> yeah and then they then we moved on up into into Austria which was absolutely gorgeous I I'm not a mountain man but those uh, the the Alps were just fantastic you could be up high and look down. You could see, you could see the stones in the lake and the things. They were so beautiful. They had zip lines. They were like little farm communities, and they'd have these zip lines that took the manure up to the fields and brought it back. And it would snow a little bit every night up on the top of the mountains and. You'd have to put a little light jacket on when you went to get the chow in the morning and things. Mm -hmm. And then they'd march us to keep us busy, I think, and two or three miles over to a lake and let us swim for a while and bring us back. And then finally they they had a point system. You got five points for the Purple Heart and five points for landings and points for major battles and if you had 30 I think it was 30 you you uh, 
we're going to be separated from the division. So I, I had just the right number of points. So I got sent to a big repo depot in France. And uh, my unit got sent back to the United States. So I was stuck in Europe for about 30 days, but I didn't complain. Uh, I had a good time. I, I was in charge of uh, the uh, supply house and uh, took care of uh, extra rifles and machine guns and what have you. And, and I uh, played a little softball and had a good, uh, had a couple of good practices. I wasn't really that good, but I made the battalion softball team and played some softball and against very, very good competition. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to go get, uh, put clothing together and go take it to the prisoners that had um, gone AWOL from the United States Army, re-equip them, have to go into the, the compound. I was glad to get out of there. Again, although they were all pretty good guys, I never had any problem there. Yeah. They're all pretty good guys. And had to get a, four kegs of beer from the local brewery and put it in all the platoon so the boys could have a beer when they wanted it. And then finally I got on the ship and came home. Well, I was uh, stationed in, uh, in Belgium for a while and and uh, my, my unit had been sent home 30 days earlier, but because of the point system, uh, I stayed there, which was fine because the Japanese war was still on and uh, my unit was going to head to the Pacific after, th after a 30-day leave at home. So uh, there were no regrets about staying there, even though they got discharged long before I did. But... Anyway, uh, just got put on a ship and uh, landed in Boston. And uh, then they transported us by train down to uh, Fort Dix. And uh, that's a continual process, 24 hours a day. They were taking people through, and you had a, a guide that took a group at a time through. And we found out that it's best that to uh, tip them because... Uh, they could make life a lot easier for you of going, going through and getting all the processing done quickly, whereas if you uh, hassled them, uh, they could make it uh, a more difficult situation. So I was discharged and jumped the train and came home to Mexico. My dad and mother picked me up at the, at the train station in Syracuse and brought me home. And uh, it was nice to be home and be in bed and nice, clean place to live again. It was great. What did your mom say to you when she first saw you? And oh, to you? she was so happy. She, she, she was almost crying. She was so happy to see me come back home alive and not banged up. My dad was just kind of nonchalant about it. But uh, I think he was, overall, I think he felt good that, that I came back because he thought I was never going to go anyway. <laughs> hmm. The only thing I really remember, and I, I mentioned it yesterday in conversation with my girlfriend, I said, you know, a number of years ago today on Christmas Day, I can remember the Red Cross came in, which they always did when, when we were in a an 8-4 situation, uh, they'd come in and sing uh, the same song, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places. And uh, I knew it was about time that we were going to head back up to the front again. I can remember walking up the trail, and I all of a sudden it kind of, geez, it kind of hit me. I said, oh, kind of got teary-eyed, and I said, Better get over this because it's a long way yet to go go home. That was the only time I I uh, I really 
really thought about. Other than that, I was never uh, never homesick and mm-hmm. about it or anything. Tell us how the war, your wartime experience impacted your life and changed it. And in, in, what are you? What's your view on that? Well, war doesn't solve anything. Unfortunately, I uh, I was a hawk. Unfortunately, and. Vietnam, I thought we were doing the right thing, and uh, I, I was absolutely wrong. And uh, I think my thinking has changed since that. I, I think other, other people have got to step forward besides us, even though our country is, is very strong mentally and military-wise. I, I think the other countries have, have got to take care of some of their own problems and not send our kids over to, to be killed and, and injured. That's, uh, medically, I'm sure everything is better, but when you, when you see all these guys with multiple limbs missing and things, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's not good. I want to, I want our country to be strong, but I want other people to step in and help. Once again, we thank Joe Massinio of the Veterans History Project. Sparky Rector was discharged from the U.S. Army in September 1945. He was the recipient of a Purple Heart. His unit received six campaign battle stars and a presidential citation. After his discharge, Sparky went to college and later became a well-known and well-loved physical education teacher in the Mexico, New York school district, coaching track, cross-country, tennis, baseball, and football. He also started the first wrestling program in Oswego County and was inducted into the New York State Wrestling Hall of Fame and was awarded the Lifetime Service Award. He and his wife, the former Mary Ellen Redman, raised six children, Noreen, Robin, Jim, Jay, Jeff, and Maura. Mrs. Rector passed in 2011. Sparky died this past October. He was 100 years old. It's an honor to acknowledge this great and humble patriot. Lawrence Sparky Rector is today's hero behind the headlines. Heroes Behind Headlines. Executive producer Ralph Fazzullo. Produced and engineered by Mike Dawson. Music provided by Extreme Music. For exclusive content, please join our Patreon group at patreon.com slash heroes behind headlines.